Our week two topic for Psi 8511 is heat transfer. How do we move heat around? And even how can we calculate our first heat transfer calculation? Super fun. So we know that heat's a form of energy, and then we know that it's kind of measuring the total kinetic energy of a substance. So all the moving energy from the particles in that substance. If you have a solid with more heat, you're going to have faster molecular motion. The particles are vibrating faster than the same solid with less heat. Now, because they are the same solid, they're also going to have your more heat solid will also have a higher temperature. But if you were to have two different solids, so say something very big that is at, you know, five degrees Celsius, that's a temperature. And then we have something very small, which is at 10 degrees Celsius. Object one, object two. Now, object two obviously has a higher temperature, but object one will likely have more heat, even though the temperature is lower, because it's bigger. So it just has a lot more kinetic energy happening inside of it. Heat can be transferred between objects or within the same medium. And the thing that we observe when we transfer heat is that the temperature will change start by talking about how we measure heat. Very, very important that you know for this entire cl class, the symbol for heat or heat transfer is going to be capital Q. So when you see a Q, we're talking heat. If we are speaking to metric units, a calorie is a heat that you need to take one gram of water and raise the temperature one degree Celsius. I don't need you to memorize that, just know where this is coming from. And that is abbreviated small cal. A kilocalorie, part of the metric system, obviously it's a thousand times bigger than a calorie. And if you wanted to relate that to water and temperature, it's going to be a kilogram of water raised one degree Celsius. So there's a conversion. One kilocalorie equals a thousand calorie. As a side note, if you are eating a snack and you see that see that it is 300 calories. The capital C means it's actually a kilocalorie. So 300 capital C calories is 300 kilocalories. Now, I don't want to bring that in because it's too confusing. We're going to stick with calories, small c as a base unit, kcal as the unit that is a thousand times bigger. We can also have a unit, we'll get into this a bit in a second, joules, which is a measure of energy. And because heat is energy, it's fair game. And the conversion factor between calories and joules is one calorie is equal to 4.19 joules. And knowing that, we could say that one kilocalorie is equal to 4,190 joules. When we move to US customary or imperial, we are talking the good old BTU, British Thermal Unit. It has the same kind of relationship. It's a heat that's required to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit, so much bigger, one pound. So I'm expecting them to be big units. They relate to energy in foot pounds. So if you wanted to convert in the imperial system, one British thermal unit, one BTU is equal to 778 foot pounds. So why don't we just use joules or foot pounds for heat. It's because heat as a concept existed before we realized it was a form of energy. So we're already talking calories in British thermal units uh, before we kind of wanted to fold it into joules and foot pounds. So we can convert and we can relate heat to work because of that. Because if heat is a type of energy, change in energy is equal to work. So when I ask how much work is done, or how to find you no know, calories from work, you were just doing a conversion. So let's look at the first one here. And I'm going to show you my conversion method uh, entirely up to you. If you go with it, I'm sure you have your own. I just really like this one. <laughs> so I do it. All right. So I'm going to start by setting up my ratio. I have joules and kilocalories. So I'm going to look down at my conversions, something that relates joules to kilocalories. And I see this second line one here, and I'm going to write it down as a fraction. I'm going to keep the units on to kind of explain what I'm doing. 
4,190 joules relates to one kilocalorie. And then I'm going to put an equal sign. And on the other side, I'm going to put my known where it belongs. So in my conversion, I put joules over kilocalories. So I'm going to put the 653920 joules on the top. And I'm going to put an X because that's what I'm solving for. It's a lot of, well, it's kind of extra work, but it just really makes sure you do the right operation. So I always teach what I call the magic banana. Wherever you have two numbers, not the X, kitty corner, you draw a diagonal between it. These are the multipliers. So the sentence that comes from this is I'm going to take the two things that were yellow, one, and it's nice with conversion, the number one always comes into play, one times six, five, three, nine, twenty, and then I'm going to divide it by the leftover one that didn't go in. Divide it by four, one ninety. And all this is doing for a conversion is telling me to divide instead of multiplying. When I do that math, I am going to get a hundred and fifty-six kilocalories as an answer. So let's go to our second one. It's multi-stepped. That's okay. We're going to get this much heat when we want to when we burn something, but we want to know how many kilojoules of energy that that is. So first of all, we know that one kilogram is going to give us 7,150 kilocalories. So we're burning 1,000. So first steps first, we got to go 7150 kcal per kilogram, and we got to multiply it by the thousand kilograms we have so that we know if we burn a thousand, we're actually going to get this much heat, seven million and change kilocalories of heat. Okay, now we're ready to convert. So first things first, I'm going to look down and I want something that relates kilocalories to kilojoules. So I have kilocalories to joules, but you know if one calorie equals 4.9 joules, you know that one kilocalorie oops, I got some writing there, is equal to 4.19 kilojoules because they're both the kilos of the base. So I can use that. I'm going to start by typing my conversion in as a fraction, 4.19 kilojoules over one kilocalorie is equal to, and notice my 7 million goes on the bottom because that's where the kilocalories are. X. So we're going to do the magic banana again. It goes diagonally between the two numbers. X is never in there and it tells you what gets multiplied. The leftover number is the divider. So I know that my unknown X will be equal to 4.19 multiplied by 7 million and change and then divided by 1 which is going to give me 29,958,500 kilojoules. So lots of energy coming from that coal. Next, we're going to head over to heat transfers, namely the type of heat transfers. So heat can move. And when heat is being transferred, that's how we measure heat, by observing its movement. The rule is heat must go from hot to cold. It can go from hot to cold uh, between two objects in contact or within the same medium, right? Even within, a, again, a, within the same solid, liquid, or gas, heat can move around. There are three main ways we're going to talk about for heat transfer. Conduction, convection, and radiation. So we're definitely going to need to know that and how to identify each one. So we'll go first to conduction. Okay, so like I said, this is a solid. <laughs> when you're in a solid or you're moving between two types of thing, a solid and a liquid, solid and a solid, whatever, there's usually a solid in play. <laughs> we have objects in contact. So we have two objects coming into contact. Let's say they're two different objects and one of them is hot. So it has a lot of kinetic energy. It's, it's um, particles are moving quickly. And as it comes into contact with something else, 
it's going to excite the particles in that second object and make it have a higher temperature. So the heat is moving from your hot object into your cooler object. The classic experiment for this is to take three different materials, whoops, we're still on the uh, highlighter here, and put them in a pan of boiling water and put some butter on them like, and see what happens. So because these are all different types of spoon, one metal, one plastic, one wood, the heat transfer, the conduction is different because the properties of metal are that it's a good conductor. It's a good conductor of heat, a good thermal conductor. So it transfers the heat very quickly up to the top of the spoon and melts the butter. Plastic is not as good, but better than wood. So you can feel free to do this experiment in your kitchen if you want. Our second type of heat transfer convection is when we see convection currents happening. And we'll see this in liquids, like in the ocean, ocean currents, or we're gonna see this as something as small scale as our room. So you supply heat to a room with a radiator, with a fire, with a space heater. And so key to this concept is the rising of the heat, okay? The warm air rises if it's above and heat is rising, that is convection. As you go by the cold window here, the temperature drop causes the cold air to follow, uh, fall and head back over this way. So you kind of get this current happening when you're talking about convection. So not gonna happen in solids, but totally can happen in liquids and gases. Our third type of heat transfer is radiation, okay? So this is when you transfer heat via waves and matter doesn't have to be there. You know, we can have heat radiation in, in, in space, but, but it is gonna be there because that's how we, we roll here on earth. So if you are getting heated by the sun, that's radiation. If you install radiant floors, that's radiation. So the illustration right here shows you that radiation, your hands are beside the fire. If you had had your hands over the fire, I would be calling that convection, that hot air rising, but radiating heat goes out in all directions. Here's a couple of situations where you get all three types of heat transfer. As the fire burns, I would like to draw some more. <laughs> Heat is radiating from the fire in all directions. As the pot gets warm, conduction is sending heat to the handle of the pot. You feel that in your hand. And as the liquid in the pot is boiling, convection is transferring heat up in the form of steam or what have you. A bigger scale example on the right, sun is heating the ground, that's radiation. The transfer of heat from hot sand, let's say, to the air or your feet, the ground is heating the air. Conduction from solid, in this case, to, you know, if your foot is another solid or to um, gas, what have you. And as that heat comes out into the air, it's going to rise via convection. We're gonna talk a bit about thermal conductivity so that we can get ready to do some math. Okay, so the symbol for thermal conductivity is K, please remember that. What's the symbol for heat? Q, heat, heat transfer is Q, thermal conductivity is K. And what is thermal conductivity? It's just the ability of a solid to conduct heat. So in the picture with the three spoons, the metal was a good thermal conductor. The wooden spoon is a good thermal insulator, which means it's a terrible thermal conductor, okay? So the higher your thermal conductivity, the better the conductor, the more heat can flow through that medium. This periodic table here is kind of hard to see, 
but it shows things that are good thermal conductors. And you'll notice, I have to get the right color here, we got our gold, silver, copper wrote our column there, and that is the metals that are great thermal conductors. And they happen to be really good electrical conductors as well. That's often common that if you're a good electrical conductor, you're also a good thermal conductor. So let's use that thermal conductivity to calculate heat transfer. This is a bear, this formula. Um, Q equals Ka small t onto brackets T2 minus T1 over big L. So I've got a list of the variables here. You're going to have to get to learn it. If you are messed up, the beauty of it is on your formula sheet, you have a table of thermal conductivities of various different solids and they have the units. So use the unit of thermal conductivity to tell you what everything else is going to be. So if you are calculating metric heat transfer from thermal conductivity, you're not going to get an output in kilocalories. It's going to be, or calories, it'll be joules. And I can tell that because when I look at the unit, or the, yeah, the unit for thermal conductivity, it has joules in it. So everything that I see in here defines what unit my variables have to be in. You don't have to memorize it. You just have to know to go look at the units of thermal conductivity on your formula sheet. Okay, so let's go over it. K is our thermal conductivity. A is an area, cross-sectional area. So if it's a square, it's going to be, you know, length times width. If it's a circle, it's going to be pi r squared. And the units for metric must be meters squared. For imperial, must be feet squared. Little t is time. For metric, we want it in seconds. And you can see that in the formula of the S. If we're doing US customary cal calculations, we need it in hours. Very, very frustrating. Temperature, at least, you know, we kind of have a handle on that. Metric will be Celsius. Imperial will be degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I've just arbitrarily decided temperature of hot side BT1 and temperature of the cold side, or sorry, vice versa, hot side BT2 and temperature cold side BT1. Just subtract the smaller number from the bigger number to get the change in temperature. L is a tough one. It's the thickness of the material. So unfortunately, you still already. So if we're going into here and we're finding our area, for the calculation our big letter L will be the thickness of the material you're going through. Now it has to be in meters or feet too and that's a big number because usually you're going to be given in centimeters or inches so remember that also has to be converted. L is the most confusing one. So let's go through some examples. You are going to want to have your formula sheet with you so let's look at this situation. Often K is not given to you. Like I gave it to you in this one. You might have to go look it up on your formula sheet. So let's start by writing down the formula. Q, the heat transfer, is equal to the thermal conductivity of the material that the heat is passing through multiplied by the cross-sectional area multiplied by the time that it passes while we're doing this multiplied by the change in temperature. So that's the temperature on the one side of the, the material versus the other side, you know, window inside the house, outside the house, and then divided by L, which is the thickness of the material. Let's list our variables. Q, we don't know. That's what we're trying to find it out. And let's write down joules right now, because we know it'll be in joules from that J. Area looking, I see it's going to be, I see an M in there. I don't see centimeters. So I know that my area is going to be in meters squared. So I have a 25 centimeter square block of brass. What does that mean? It means it's the square that is 25 times 25 centimeters. So we are going to do our conversions first. So we need to find the area of that by doing meters, 0.25 times 0. 25, which will give you 
0 0.0625 meters squared. Okay, so just remember and convert linear measurements before you make squares or cubes. Okay, let's go to time. Time is given to us in seconds. Okay, the green is the time, seconds is good. I don't have to convert that. So that's good to go into the formula as is. Temperatures, T2 is a hot one, 90, and T1 is the cold one, 20. Whatever, just make sure you get 70 and not minus 70 when you subtract them, and you'll be fine. And oh, I'm running out of room. Last thing we need is the thickness of the material. And I don't see centimeters in the formula, so it's also going to have to be in meters. Here's the thickness L. Three centimeters is equal to 0 0.03 meters divided by 100. So let me just highlight everything that's going to go into this because I've made a mess of this. Area, thickness, the temperatures, and the time. And let's build it up. They gave us the value for K. And on your formula sheet, we have both imperial and metric listed side by side. So pick the right number. We found the area ourselves. We didn't have to change the time. We are going to do some subtraction first. And we know that's going to be 70, but we'll just write it down. And we're going to divide by 0 0.03. This is just plug and play on your calculator. I'll do two steps. 120 times 0 0.0625 times 30 times 70. Do that math first because it's in brackets. It gives me 15,750. And I still have to divide it by 0 0.03. And when I do that final math, I'm going to get 525,000 joules. Joules are small units. You often get giant numbers when you're working with joules. Why does this kind of calculation matter? Well, for you guys, heat transfer is huge. You've got to refrigerate, right? You've got to heat. You've got to dump heat, bring heat into a situation as fast as you possibly can. So let's take it to refrigeration, um, evaporator and the condenser. We've got to dump heat quickly. So how can we do that? Well, we're gonna make metal tubing that is got high thermal conductivity so that we can increase the thermal conductivity K, which is going to increase the heat transfer. You also add all those fins on your tubing to increase the surface area that's exposed. And that increases area, which is also anything in the, the let's put the formula down, Anything in the numerator of the formula, if you bump that up, you're going to increase your Q, your heat transfer. So looking at that formula, if I double the surface area by adding fins to my evaporator tubes, do I double my heat flow? Sure. If you do a multiplier of 2 up here, your heat transfer is going to be double. Your heat flow will be doubled. Now what variable could you decrease? in order to have greater heat flow. Anything on the top, you want to increase. <laughs> you want more time for it to flow. You want a bigger area for it to flow through. You want a better thermal conductor. Um, you want a bigger heat differential. The only thing that you could decrease to have greater heat flow is if you made the thickness of the material thinner. Of course, if you have a nice little thin object that you're sending heat through, it's going to transfer more in a given amount of time if L is smaller. So we'll put down L or the thickness. Another thing that we can calculate knowing the thermal conductivity of a material is its R value. And our R value is, you know, when you see the pink insulation, here's an R value, R13. Okay. It's reported without the units because they're crazy stupid <laughs> but there are some units that matter when you go into it so R is very straightforward it will come out technically unitless because we don't want to deal with the units and to find it we are going to divide the thickness of the material 
by the thermal conductivity. Oh, too many words. Thermal, which is something we look up or are given. Okay, so what, oh, capital R, what is the R value of eight inches of cellulose fiber that has, and cellulose fiber has a K value of a thermal conductivity of 0 0.023. Now, it hasn't told me whether that is imperial or metric, but I'm going to assume it's imperial because R value is an imperial measurement. We don't do it in metric. So if I was going to find this R value, I have to take my eight inches and convert it into feet. That is required. So we're gonna take eight. How do we make feet from inches? Eight divided by 12. And we're gonna get about 0.6667. It's continuing, okay? All right, here we go. Our value is that repeating decimal, the thickness divided by the thermal conductivity of cellulose fiber in imperial units. There we go. We do that math and we get about 29. So this would be our 29. That's it for this stuff. We're gonna spend a lot more time in class going over the heat transfer calculations in both metric and imperial because those are the most tricky ones, but I just wanted to get one up in the YouTube slide so you at least have one reference there.